Hey everybody, and welcome to episode number one of Flyfish University TV. So late in 2020, I got this idea. Somebody from our podcast, the Flyfish University podcast, had written in and said, I'd love to see if you could make some of these into some YouTube videos, which just got me going down the rabbit hole and sparked a whole bunch of ideas, and I'm very, very excited to share our first episode. Today we're talking 21 fly fishing tips heading into 2021. So thank you very much for joining me here. Before we get started, I'd love to offer you a free copy of my book, Seven Steps to Fly Fishing Success. You can head to flyfishuniversity.com forward slash book. That is my gift to you. If you like fly fishing and you maybe want to increase your skill set a little bit, you want to learn a bit more about the fundamentals of fly fishing, this would be a great place to start. Again, thank you so much. Hit subscribe and the bell icon for new videos each and every week. And I hope you enjoy today's episode. 21 trout fishing tips heading into 2021. 2020 obviously was a crazy, crazy year for so many people, including myself, but you know, we learned a lot and fly fishing grew exponentially, probably more than it ever has in history, which has been so, so amazing. And it's very great to see so many new people coming into the sport of fly fishing that might not have been interested in it previously. So today I've got my list. I'm talking 21 trout fishing tips for 2021 and I hope that you can make this your best year of fly fishing yet even if maybe you're just interested in the sport and you know you're looking to learn more about it you're looking to get into it and you don't really know where to start hopefully this episode is valuable to you so quest or uh, tip number one is this is very important, is we're so incredibly interested in filling our fly boxes with the most intricate, the most diverse fly patterns, which is great, but tip number one is to fish fewer flies better. And the reason that I think that this is important is that it's good to develop a high level of confidence in a small number of flies. What this is gonna do is it's gonna limit the amount of time that you're spending changing flies all the time because a lot of times it's not the fly that we're fishing it's maybe how we're fishing the fly and how diligently we're fishing the fly or presenting the fly that's going to make the difference now this doesn't mean that changing flies is not important i just think that sometimes we get so wrapped up in changing flies changing flies changing flies looking for the perfect pattern when really there's a lot of other things to factor in uh, alongside you know making proper fly selection so tip number one definitely is is fish a smaller number of flies with a much greater sense of confidence and a lot of times you know confidence in a certain fly pattern is something that we just derive through having uh, successful outings with uh, with with a particular pattern so definitely I think it's important to keep innovating and keep keep searching and finding new patterns but I also think that it's really important to have a small selection of flies that you can rely on under even the most difficult of circumstances. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is, has to do with fly casting. And I'm a huge fan of this. Take a casting lesson from a certified casting professional. So the reason why I think this is important is that it's very hard to, to reverse bad habits in comparison to building good habits from scratch. I'm a huge fan of really getting the right information right off the bat so that you can really build out that solid foundation. And casting is one area where, you know, like a golf swing, just because you do it for a long time doesn't put you at any advantage if you're not doing it correctly, if you're not practicing the right principles. So definitely I would say, you know, tip number two is find a certified casting professional and take a casting lesson with them. It's going to just, it's, it's really gonna open things up and change the game for you in so many different ways. Now, tip number three also has to do with casting, and that is to carry less and shoot more. What I mean by this is to leverage the design of modern day fly line technology, where we have, you know, we have the head portion, the shooting portion of the line uh, separate from, from the running line. Okay, so the way that a lot of our fly lines are constructed now, where the, the majority of the mass is in the front, you know, usually the front third of the line, most of our lines now are 100 feet. They're designed to carry that amount of line and, and use that, that heavier portion of the line at the front to load the fly rod and to use the back, end of the, uh, the back end of the line, which is the running line, to shoot through the guides, okay? So when people are trying to learn how to cast further, a lot of times a huge mistake that's very, very easy to make is trying to carry too much line in the air, 
right? And what that leads to is too much false casting, too much time spent trying to propel small amounts of line out at a time when really we're at a huge advantage being able to use these fly lines to the maximum of their potential and carry, you know, 30, 35, 40 feet of line in the air and use that remaining, you know, 60 or 70 feet on the back end of the line stacked at our feet to shoot through the guides. This is one of the most important things I think in casting, especially in modern day with just the way that fly rod manufacturers are leaning more and more towards these ultra fast rods. They couple perfectly with, uh, with a lot of these new, you know, heavier tapered uh, lines that incorporate maybe even a bit more grain weight to match these new super fast uh, rods that are on the market. So I would just say, you know, carry less line in the air, keep more line at your feet and really use that, uh, that shooting line for exactly what it's designed for. Tip number four, okay, and this, this is a big one. When you're stripping flies to keep the angle of your rod pointing down to almost keep your, your, your tip of your rod stabbed into the water. Now what this is gonna do, the problem with keeping your rod tip high while you are stripping, there's two things. The first one is that you're going to incorporate a lot of slack into the line that is totally unnecessary. You're going to remove that direct connection that you want uh, from the tip of your fly rod down to your fly, whether you're fishing a floating or a sinking line. Uh, the other thing is that you're really decreasing the amount of leverage that you have on the hook set when your fly rod is already up, when the tip of your rod is already lifted up in the air. It's really not what we want. Uh, we want to have, you know, if, if we're if we're trout setting or strip setting, we want to have a direct connection and the most leverage that we possibly can. We don't really want to minimize that by keeping that uh, the tip of the fly rod pointed straight up in the air. Okay. So tip number five. This is a big one because we're still in the winter time months right now. It's still January. Uh, I've come to actually really enjoy January. It's a month that uh, usually I'd be doing some traveling right now, but uh, obviously given circumstances, it's not really uh, not really the year to be doing it. So this tip is to fish the fly low and slow in cold water temperatures. So when we're trout fishing, their metabolic rate is going to dip substantially in really, really cold water. And most of the time, you know, where I live in the Pacific Northwest in British Columbia, we're fishing quite cold water through the winter time months. So really, you know, presenting that fly close to where they're gonna be resting. And of course this is, we're talking moving water right now. All my still water is completely frozen. Uh, we're talking fishing that fly in, in stretches of water where they're going to be very, very comfortable. They don't have to work too hard uh, to swim against the current. And basically fishing that fly low and slow being, you know, close to where they're gonna be resting and as slow as we can, whether you're nymphing or fishing a, a swung fly technique. One thing I like doing if I'm swinging flies in moving water in, in the winter time months is to actually hold uh, the tip of my rod out a little bit towards the center of the river. And what that's gonna do is just slow that fly down, allow that fly to track, uh, you know, in, in that slow tantalizing manner. That's very, very nice when we're working hard to get fish to move to the fly, you know, in, in really cold, you know, high 30s, uh, water temperature, it's not all that easy to get them to commit. So to make it as easy as possible, I like to fish sometimes a bit heavier tip, sometimes a bit slower water, and really try to slow that fly down, work it diligently through the piece of water that I'm fishing. Okay, so number six, uh, this is a great tip. This is one that, uh, that I try to implement as much as I can, and it's to fish outside of the box in periods of slow fishing. So what I mean by fishing outside the box is fish some weird patterns, fish some weird techniques, some stuff that doesn't, that you don't typically think about because fishing all the manners that you're used to fishing, if they're not working, there's really no point in beating a dead horse. It's a great time to step outside the box, try some weird things when, when fishing seems really, really slow. So one example I would give to this would be a, a friend of mine, fishing partner of mine, Dave. Uh, we were fishing a trophy lake in the interior of BC. This was 2017. Fishing was dismal. It was so slow. The lake was still kind of turning over and Dave had had tied on, uh, you know, we're fishing micro leeches and balanced leeches and uh, chronomid pupa and larva imitations, all the usual stuff that we would fish on our lakes. And Dave said, I give up. He said, I'm going to just fish something, you know, totally outside the box. And he tied on a uh, Bow River bugger, which is a uh, 
kind of a gaudy, nasty looking fly. Number four, so a decent size on a type seven, so seven inch per second sinking line. Started casting it into the shallows and ripping it off the drop off and uh, eventually, you know, just started putting on a clinic and next thing I know, we're all back at camp tying up these big ugly streamers, flies we would never even think about fishing in our lakes, but it was a prime example that when nothing else is working, you might as well step outside the box and, and try something different. Tip number seven is that the observant angler wins. Okay, so really in 2021, if there's something that you can focus on is focus on increasing your level of observancy when you're on the water. This means paying attention to what's going on around you. Other anglers, you know, are there birds dipping down? Oftentimes that means that there's bugs coming off. Uh, what's going on across the lake? Can you see, you know, is the, is the barometer changing? Basically, how many different things can I factor in that might play a part in whether I'm going to be catching fish or not right now. So I think it's really, really important to just really focus on being very, very observant. The more observant we can be, the more things we're gonna factor in and ultimately I think that the, the more productive we are going to be on the water. Okay, number eight, uh, this is something that, I'm, that, that really intrigues me is, is organization, fly box organization. And one thing that I like to do is to color code my fly boxes. This might sound uh, this might sound like a little bit too particular, but it's really nice when you can look in your box. Especially, I'll do this with like my chronomids south of the border. They call them we call them midges. But uh, a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll I'll look into my box and I know exactly what I'm looking for because I've coded the darkest flies to the brightest flies you know, black leading into brown, uh, leading into light brown, leading into gray, uh, leading into dark green, light green, so on and so forth. So I know exactly where I'm looking when I look into my fly boxes because I've color coded them. Obviously some patterns this is easier to do than others, but if you have the chance, you know, you're sitting inside, uh, this, is, this is something that's worth your time because it's gonna shorten the amount of time you're gonna spend searching for the fly that you want to tie on. Okay. Number nine, and this is a really good one, is to fish methods that you are uncomfortable with. So an example of this would be, uh, I, I really spend most of my time on still waters fishing floating lines. I love fishing floating lines, but there's a lot of times when sinking lines are a much more advantageous uh, approach. They're gonna get your fly down, they're gonna move the fly at the speed that the fish wanna see it moving at. And depending of course, what time of year, water temperature or pattern that we're fishing, you know, what insect or, or invertebrate or bait fish are we imitating. But uh, a way that I like to do this is to actually leave the setups that I fish the most in the car uh, and, or, or at home, right? And, and fish the methods or techniques that I don't usually fish. Another example of this would be uh, steelhead fishing, I was, I was so adamant on catching a Thompson River steelhead on a dry fly that one time I did a whole trip where I left my, my Skagit lines, I left my big intruder flies, I left them all actually at home and only bought a box, uh, brought a box of dry flies and my, my floating Scandi line. I didn't get a fish on that trip, but what it did was it forced me to fish the methods that I was uncomfortable with without the temptation to revert back to what was comfortable and safe and familiar. I think it's a great way, a great technique for people to grow as an angler is to continually, you know, fish methods that you're not used to. One thing I'm really learning a lot about now is check nymphing. So uh, it's fun for me to go to, uh, to go to a river and, and just bring, you know, some check nymphs and, and not have the option to revert back to what I'm used to fishing, even if I suck. At, uh, at fishing the, the new method, which at this time there's a lot of methods that, that I still have a lot to learn about. Okay, uh, number 10, this is huge. Scale down your presentation and scale down the bulk of your fly in high sun. So in really, really high sun, it can be tricky conditions. You know, as anglers, we love fishing when it's warm and it's sunny, but sometimes it's hard to, uh, it's, it's hard to get fish to eat when you're fishing, you know, high sun, not a lot of wind, especially fishing some species like, you know, salmon or steelhead. But even in trout fishing, something that works really well for me is, is the better that they can see, uh, the more that I am going to scale my presentation down, okay? It's, it's really, really important to 
fish maybe a bit smaller, more sparsely dressed fly that doesn't have as much flash. We don't need to, unlike periods of low light, we don't really need to coax them into seeing our fly. Uh, a lot of times when, when you know, you're fishing that high sun, especially high sun, high visibility, clear water, can be a really tricky time to get fish to eat. So definitely scale that presentation down and fish flies that are a little bit more sparsely dressed. Okay, uh, number 11 is to fish the fly two or three ways before changing. Okay, so uh, my friend Phil Rowley and I, we teach a lot of still water fly fishing workshops. And something that we iterate to our students often is to, rather than changing flies all the time, fish the fly two or three different ways before you actually change. So an example of this would be, uh, let's say that I have uh, a leech pattern that I'm really, really confident in. Okay, rather than, and I, and I know that the conditions are conducive to leech fishing, maybe it's early spring. Okay, sometimes what I'll do is I'll fish that same pattern on, let's say uh, underneath a strike indicator, then I'll fish it on a, on a clear intermediate or a camo line, and then I might, you know, go hunting through the basement and I'll, and I'll fish it on a type five or a type seven line, and I'll vary the retrieve, I'll vary the lines I'm fishing it on, I'll even vary the leader lengths uh, and, and what this is going to do is just allow me to fish flies that I'm confident in and change up that presentation because like I said a lot of times it's the way the fly is being fished that has such an impact even sometimes beyond uh, the actual pattern that we are fishing. Okay, number 12 is to fish a larger silhouette in dirty water. Okay, dirty water means that fish are going to have a, a lesser window of time to make up the decision as to whether they would like to eat the fly that we're offering them or not. So a bigger, blockier silhouette, this might include fishing flies that have uh, materials that don't allow a lot of light to come past them. Uh, rabbit strip is one that I really like because it has a nice blocky presentation uh, or, or a blocky silhouette. This works really, really well in, in dirty water when those fish have a shorter period of time in which they are going to be able to make up their mind. Do I want to eat this or no? Sometimes a nice big presentation coming straight at them, you know, going to the opposite end of the spectrum like we just talked about, scaling down your presentation in high sun and clear water, scale up your presentation in dirty water or periods of low light. Okay, lucky number 13. This is for all my still water enthusiasts like myself. If you live in an area where you can do this, I, in British Columbia, we are—I mean, we have just amazing resources for this. Is to uh, study your stocking reports for still waters. Okay, so if if I want to look out for, if I want to search out a new trophy lake, which I do like to do from time to time, uh, is what I'll do is I'll actually look at my—I'll uh, actually look at the stocking reports. Of the Freshwater Fishery Society. Of British Columbia has an amazing, 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 I'll leave a link down below, great resource for anglers that are looking to study new water bodies based on the region, based on how many fish are going into them or the type, you know, the strain of fish that are going in. So I know for sure that there are certain strains of trout that we have stocked in our lakes that grow quicker than others. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll narrow down my search, I'll funnel my search results so that I'm only looking for those lakes that are holding those different, uh, those certain types of fish, certain strains of fish, and and you know whether they're a diploid or a triploid, so sterile or non-sterile uh, fish. Really, it's going to shorten the amount of time it's going to take for me to find new lakes that hold uh, the type of trout that I like, which are big ones. Okay, uh, number fourteen. This is huge is to journal each and every outing. This is something I've done for over 10 years. It's so, so important. So this would be things like date, hours fished, species, who did you fish with, what's the bar barometer, water clarity, water temperature, were there bugs hatching, no bugs hatching, what worked, what didn't work, and most of all, the most important thing you can journal, what's one key takeaway that I can take from today's outing that's ultimately going to make me a better angler in the long run, okay. Moving on, number 15 is to lose fewer fish at the boat or at the net by allowing your the blank of your rod to soak up as much of that shock as possible. I see, especially fishing trophy still waters, if I'm guiding, I see a lot of people lose fish close to the boat if they don't have, if they're too aggressive, reeling down, tightening down on the fish, getting that fly too close to the rod tip. Two things can happen here. 
the fish takes off and we're either gonna bend the hook out or we're gonna break the leader. Uh, so what I like to do is have at least a rod length of, at least a rod length of leader out the end of the rod tip. If you're fishing a short leader, then just say, have at least a rod length of line from the tip of your rod all the way down your fly. What that's gonna do is it's gonna really lessen the amount of pressure that's being put on that fish as it's being slid into the net. Whether you're fishing still or moving water, this is gonna equate to a lot fewer fish uh, broken off or a lot fewer bent hooks uh, really close to the boat. Okay, number 16, take the indicator off when you're fishing spooky fish, be this still, still water or moving water, either you know, scale down the size of your indicator and even the color or take it off completely. There's a couple of lakes that I fish that hold really nice big fish that can be very hard to catch sometimes. And one of my favorite things to do is actually remove the indicator and just fish a naked floating line. This would be something else, you know, for, for a later date. Uh, but this is something that works really, really well in trophy lakes is to actually take the indicator off or fish a really, really small indicator. This also works too for fish that are biting the fly really light. So say in periods of cold water, early or late season, that metabolic rate is down and they might just be mouthing the fly. Bigger indicator is not going to reveal those bites in the same way that a small indicator or no indicator is going to. Okay, uh, moving on, number 16, sorry, sorry, number 17 is this again for my still water junkies is to focus on these the transition areas okay so fish just like humans just like pretty much every species of anything on earth we're wired to survive they are wired to survive first and foremost before anything so this means they are wired to live and everything else is a luxury eating is a luxury surviving is an absolute necessity okay so what they'll do is is they'll use the comfort of deep water to remain safe from uh, predators like ospreys, eagles, otters, so on and so forth. And then they'll slide into the productive feeding areas to get their food. And then a lot of times they'll retreat back down to the safety of the deep water. You see this especially in early spring and late fall when most of the food is found in less than 10 feet of water. Now, as the spring progresses, you know they can find different species, dragonflies, chronomids, uh, closer to the thermocline in deeper water, you know, 15, 20 to 25 feet of water. Most of the feeding still, you know, is going to be done in less than 20 feet of water. Uh, but, you know, and this has to do more with, with photosynthesis, which we're not going to talk anything about right now. But anyways, leverage the patterns of fish sliding from deep water to shallow water by intercepting them on those transition areas which are you know ledges and drop offs. So a lot of time what I'll do is, there's three ways to do this. You can either anchor in the shallow water, cast out to the deep water. Uh, you can anchor in the deep water, cast into the shallow water, or you can actually anchor your boat uh, alongside and fish your lines parallel to the drop off. In BC, I'm allowed to fish two rods at one time. So what I'll do is I'll anchor one side of my boats on the deep water, one side of my boats on the shallow water. I've got one rod that's off in the deep water. Let's say one's in, in 15 or 16 feet and one's in seven or eight feet. It's a nice way to intercept those fish as they're transitioning from the deep water up into the shallow water. Okay, and number 19, we're almost there, is to trigger the chase response. Okay, so fish just like cats, just like bears, just like a lot of uh, uh, predatory species have this natural chase response, this natural trigger where they like to chase things out of curiosity. Now, let's look at shark attacks for a minute. I like watching Shark Week. I'm a huge shark fanatic. And, uh, and, and basically, why do shark attacks take place? Well, a lot of times it's because sharks don't have a way to sample their food other than with their mouth. That's, that's their biggest senses are taste and smell. Well, they can't just reach out their fin and, and you know feel the texture of it. So sometimes they have to sample, which unfortunately sometimes ends up being humans on surfboards. They have to sample their food with their mouth. Well, a lot of times when there's no insects hatching, trout will behave in, in a manner where they will chase down you know, these, these odd looking things and they'll, they'll eat them out of curiosity. You're triggering that reaction bite. So this is where we'll fish, you know, larger gaudier flies like boobies and blobs in lakes uh, or streamers in moving water is we're triggering that curiosity response. It's a really, really nice way to still salvage, uh, still, you know, pick up some fish when there's not a lot of insect activity going on. 
Okay, number 20, second last one. Number 20 is to start fishing hot spot fly patterns. Okay, what I mean by this is to fish a fly that has a small, uh, very, very bl bright fluorescent addition built into the body of what might be otherwise a pretty natural looking pattern. A favorite example of this for me, I'll, I'll give you two. The first one would be something like an egg sucking leech or a hothead leech where basically you're gonna fish you know, a, a nice drab natural looking black uh, or maroon or brown leech pattern that's gonna have a bright pink or chartreuse or orange uh, bead or cone head at the front, okay? What I think this does is it really lures fish in from a greater distance. Uh, these can work against you a bit in clear water, but in, in tannic or stained water, I like fishing flies that have, you know, they look pretty natural otherwise, but they do have, uh, they, they definitely do have a, uh, they have a hot spot built somewhere into the pattern. Now, I realized that I missed one here somewhere, and that was number 18. Now, number 18 is to fish a non-slip mono loop or a loop knot of some sort under the applicable circumstances, okay? What this does is it allows the fly to move in a very, very natural manner. Now, you don't need this with all fly patterns, but, you know, flies like streamers, for example, you want that natural undulating motion. You can hinder that a bit with flies that cinch right down to the eye of the fly, like an improved clinch or a uni knot. So what I'll do is, is fish a loop knot that's gonna allow that fly to swim freely or with flies like, you know, like a chronomid or if you're nymphing, you want that fly to hang uh, in the most natural manner possible. If you wanna learn how to tie this knot, I'm gonna leave a link down below for a free six part knot tying course called Six Knots for Freshwater Fly Fishing. It's gonna help you, show you exactly how to tie the non-slip mono loop, something that I rely on big time. Okay, the very, very last one, and in my in my experience and my opinion, the most important fly fishing tip that I could ever give somebody that, that I ever learned myself, and that is to spend this year surrounding yourself with a community of anglers that know a lot more than you do. I still try to do this. Every time I go, I like fishing with people who are better than me because it allows you to absorb their knowledge quicker and it allows you to implement it faster. So what really, really changed the game for me when I started was getting the right information from people who knew what they were talking about, okay? Getting the right information from people who have the results that you want, very, very important. It's just gonna allow you to really increase and shorten that learning curve, uh, and it's going to allow you to decrease the amount of time that you're spending learning a lot of things that might frustrate you otherwise. So anyways, that wraps up 21 trout fishing tips for 2021. Had the idea for this episode in the lineup at the grocery store the other day, which is, uh, of course, where most of our uh, best thinking happens when we're not trying to make it happen. So anyways, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. I really, really hope that you enjoy it. And feel free to drop me a question at flyfishuniversity.com forward slash questions. Uh, coming up on Friday, each and every Friday, we have an episode a podcast episode where we answer questions from readers all over the place. It's super, super fun. And again, I'd love to invite you to grab a free copy of my book, Seven Steps to Fly Fishing Success. I really, really hope that this helps you in your fly fishing journey wherever you may be. Thank you again and best of luck on your ventures on the water in 2021.